What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 804 of The O Show. Remember to comment, like, and subscribe on our YouTube channel at Jack O'Hara TV. Use that promo code, capital O-S-H-O-W-20, for $20 off your next order using TickPick.com. Marcus Deegan, let's cut right to the chase. I was expecting a big bag of weed right in the center here. Hey, we can we can go downstairs afterwards. They got the whole dispensary. Thanks so much to Harding Cannabis Dispensary. My boy Ivan here setting me up. We uh, our team here was brought out the lint rollers. We had lint on our shirts. They were yeah. making sure we looked really nice before we started. I never had that done before. It's quality from the moment you walk in here. This beautiful studio and everyone's very the hospitality. nice. Hospitality. It smells good down there. And the best part about it is, is that you can get gummies and joints and blunts and things. And gummies and joints, joints and, and blunts, blunts and things. things. Gummies and joints and blunts and, blunts and things. things. You see, I love it. I love it. I love the energy, man. You you DM'd me like three, four days ago. I gave you the follow. You interviewed someone, maybe one of my friends, and you're like, you commented on one of my posts with my buddy Frank Sidoris, um, talking about Michael Jackson. You said you have a better Michael Jackson story. I have the best Michael Jackson story. Well, let's hear it. I've okay, so waiting. I haven't re. So check it out. I, I said to my girl before I came here. I said, "I'm he's the reason how we connected was through the Michael Jackson comment." So I'm going to really go into detail about the whole Michael Jackson story that I have. So back in 2004, I was working at the Excalibur Hotel. You know the Excalibur Casino here oh, right, on the Strip, right. right? They had a show there called Thunder from Down Under. It's like Chippendales, but yep. Australian version. I was the host. 27 years I hosted. I retired in 2020. And any everyone that worked there, everyone that knew me, knew that I was the fanatical Michael Jackson fan. There was no, I have Michael Jackson tattoos. I had a Michael Jackson room in my house. I was like Michael Jackson obsessed, right? So then one day, one of the head of the, of the CEOs of the Excalibur came up to me and goes, Marcus, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anybody. I was like, okay. He's like, Michael Jackson's going to be here tomorrow night. It's like, what? He goes, yeah, he's bringing a bunch of kids from the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and they're going to be downstairs, and they're going to watch the Tournament of the King show. The Tournament of the King show is like uh, Knights of the Round Table kind of show. You sit around, and you eat the chickens and stuff like that. So I was like, great. He said, so if you want to come down there, you know, we can't promise anything, but you know, maybe you can at least see him as, as you know, sitting in the chair. or you, He's going to be in the arena, so you'll at least get to see him. I was like, oh, absolutely, of course. So that night came, went to the Excalibur, kind of found out where in the room that he was going to be sitting, made my way over to the exit door near where he was going to be sitting. And I stood by this exit door. Anyway, everybody started coming into the arena it was getting to that time and I'm next thing I know this door opens one big security guy walks through just kind of checks around and a bunch of kids walk in and then Michael Jackson walks through the door and I'm literally, literally sta- standing right here and he walks through that door it's about that far away walks right in front of my eyes like that now mind you now I'm seeing someone that you know I would pray to pray to God yeah. when I was a little boy Please, God, let me meet Michael Jackson. I just want to. I just want to see Michael Jackson in person. You know, when you're a kid and you know you idolize and 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 you know you just want to meet that person. Oh, you, you, and they just glow when you see them too. So I was, I was kind of, I kind of had an emotional moment to myself right there as as he kind of walked past and went and sat down in his seat, which may have been as far away as across the hallway out there. And then I'm, I can only see him from behind, right? He's wearing a red shirt and black pants. He's got the straight hair, no glasses. And uh, there's one of this big security guard. He's standing maybe not as, as close to you, but I, I thought, I'm going to talk to this guy. So I go up to MJ security and I'm like, hey, how you doing, mate? As soon as you say mate and you start talking in my accent, everybody wants to talk to you. You know, it's been a, a great tool of mine over the years. It's helped me in many different situations, getting out of tickets, meeting celebrities, uh, you know, getting gigs and stuff like that. So I start talking to his security guard, which, which I didn't know at the time is his head security guard. I was like, you know, I've, I've got a CD case. Is, do you reckon there's any way that you would be able to get Michael to sign it for me and he's like well he's not really doing 
kind of any autographs or signings right now, but let me let me check with him and maybe we can work something out after. And I thought, fuck, I'm going to get an autograph from Michael Jackson. I can't believe it. Then you, the next thing you know, I'm just standing there watching the show and now I've moved a little bit closer to where they are. Mm-hmm. There's like this wall there, so I've moved. So now I'm kind of... In, uh, this close to Michael Jackson right near the wall and so he's kneeling down in between his two children and they're watching the show he's kneeling down his legs are sticking out he's got his hands over his two kids and they're talking back and forth this waitress just happens to walk past with a tray and a bunch of drinks and trips over MJ's feet flies over on the ground glasses and shit go everywhere so I've rushed over to help her you know to help pick her up but at the same time MJ did so we both got there at the same time. I kind of grabbed her on the arm and then he put his hand over and grabbed her. So we've both, he's got one arm, I've got the other arm and we pick her up and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. And she's like, no, 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 it's okay, I'm clumsy. I, I was kind of frozen right there because now I am, I'm touching my, like my hand is touching my idol. Not only just my idol, but it's Michael fucking Jackson. I can swear on this podcast, right? You can say whatever you want. It's Michael fucking Jackson. And so she kind of it went, you know, a few seconds went past and him and I helped pick up the glasses and she grabbed the tray and kind of walked off and he was standing there and I kind of <coughs> went like this, like I was going to laugh. And he kind of looked at me and was like, <gasps> he goes, don't laugh. And I kind of went like that. And anyway, he went and sat back down. Maybe a minute or two later, his security guard goes over and he whispers something in MJ's ear. And then Michael Jackson turns around like this and he looks at me and he goes, come here. And he moved over. He goes, come and sit down here next to me. So I come over and I sit there and I'm sitting next to Michael. I'm sitting next to Michael Jackson right now. Now, I, like... This, this guy is the most famous man on the planet and someone that I was... Uh, would obsessed be the word, honey? Yeah. Yeah. I was obsessed. Definitely was obsessed with the music and the dance and the look and just everything about it. So we're sitting here and, you know, we're talking back and forth. Limited conversation. Just a little bit here and there. And he asked me about my tattoos and stuff like that. The show finishes. He gets up and he goes, oh, I'm not going to do any pictures or anything right now, but we're going to go into the back area and meet the cast. So if you want to come back in, you know, I'll sign your CD for you. It's like, that's great. Anyway, he's sitting there and his kids are sitting there. And I look and he's, he's, drinking, he's drinking a Shirley Temple, which is Sprite and red, uh, what is it, babe? Gr- red grenadine. So he's drinking it and he's sitting there and he's talking. So then he turns his head and I'm like, there's a fucking souvenir right there. Mm -hmm. So I've gone, (laughs) I've grabbed his glass, finished what was in it, under the shirt like that. (laughs) Under the shirt. Now this, this is the, this is, this This is is the glass. This is it. That's the the actual cup. Yeah. Look at this. Michael That's Jackson's DNA, <laughs> no DNA, DNA is in there. We can make our own Michael Jackson. We can. You understand that? I know, right? Oh my! You didn't even wash it a little bit. Absolutely not. Oh my lord! Right. So, so that's not the best part. So, we go back. He's meeting all the cast, and he sees me, and we go up, and we have a moment, and I'm like. You know, it was just so great to meet you. And he goes, oh, I really love your accent. You're Australian. I'm like, yeah, I love Australia. He goes, I love Australia and I love all the animals there. And he asked me about a couple of the animals and I, I gave him, you know, um, my opinion on it. And um, I had these two stuffed koala bears, which I had specifically brought for his two children. I was like, ah, oh. security grabbed them, checked them out first. And he goes, he, then he gives them back to me. He goes, yeah, it's okay. I go, oh, I brought these for the kids. My, I was calling him Mike, like like I fucking knew yep. the, like I knew, like I knew the guy. Yeah, yeah. I brought I brought these two stuff to, teddies for the kids, Mike. And you know what he said? He's like, oh, "Where's mine? 
I was like, ah, you know what? He goes, where's my, seriously, where's mine? I was like, you know what? I, I really didn't um, think about it, but I had to apologize. And like, he's, nah, I'm only kidding. And I was like, look, um, I forgot my CD. Would you be able to sign my shirt? He's like, of course. So he grabs the pen and he signs my shirt. To Marcus, I love you, Michael Jackson. Which is, which is this shirt right now, here. Now, have you washed this at all? Or is so... It still- this is still this is still original bar one wash. There was an accidental wash, but luckily it was done with a permanent marker that it didn't come off. But yeah, that's it there. Were you like losing was, your mind? So no. So here's the really really cool thing about it. Then we proceeded to take a bunch of photographs together. We talked for another five minutes. You know, he gave me a hug and kissed me on the cheek even, and I was cool as a cucumber. Cool as a cucumber. But then the drive on the way home. <laughs> that uh, You're probably literally just on a cloud at that point. So Nothing can get you down. I don't think that it hit me until I was driving home listening to a, uh, my CD that was in the CD player back then. And um, I had to pull over. And fucking had a moment. When I say had a moment, I was hysterically crying in the car and just couldn't believe it that God had granted my, uh, you know, he had he had granted my prayer and, and exceeded what I what I ever thought was yeah. going to happen. Totally exceeded it. It was an unbelievable experience. People, the, the crazy p- questions that people ask me about that was, what did he smell like? Is a common question that I get asked. What did he smell like? I don't like? think that would be within my first 10 questions. I know, right? You. I tell you, these Michael Jackson fanatics, they can be fucking crazy. What did he smell like? Well, I'll give you the answer. He smelled like hairspray and makeup. But one thing I will tell you about him is he had huge, dry hands. I'm talking <laughs> size hands. Really? Oh, Like athlete size hands? Like or? unbelievable huge hands so if you ever you know next time you look at a photo of michael jackson check out how big his hands are and um and and that's it that's my michael jackson story that is a story that nobody else can share like that's and to think michael jackson like who can we even relate in today like i guess taylor swift would be on that level of like fame, but you can't even compare her to what he went through and the amount of fame that he did. He was like the most famous man on the planet for decades. And off the planet too, I'd say. I would say so too. Like if there's a lot of people, I'll ask people all the time who work in the music industry, who's one guy you never got to see perform that you wish you did? It's Michael Jackson. Yeah, it's Carrot Top said it to me once too. He's like, fuck, you know, I've met everyone. I've met everyone except him. And uh, my girl says it to me all the time. She's like, do you realize you're like in that minute, you're minute 1%. percent of people, oh, but not sorry, not people, fans of fans that get to experience what I experience. I don't think, you know, I don't think a lot of people get to do that, you're especially my, at, you know, at, at, at the age I was at, like maybe yeah. the younger kids that are, you know, sick or whatever, get to go to Neverland and experience right. that. But as an adult... And as an adult male, you know what I mean? It's not as if, it's not every day that you get to kind of spend fucking an hour and 10 minutes with Michael Jackson. No, that's and that's something that you can't even control. It's like, one day I want to meet Michael Jackson. Well, it's not in your control. Yeah. But the fact that that happens, like you're in the 1% of people that met him, but you're in the like 0.00001% that actually had like a moment with him where you actually got to interact with him for yeah. more than just like a split second. Like, Hey, nice to meet you. I'm a big fan. And he didn't have glasses on, which was another thing. As oh, well. yeah, he wasn't hidden. No, nah, he wasn't hidden at all. And you know, it's, I don't know. It's like one of those, one of those things that happened, like one of those amazing things that has happened to me in my life. One of those great things that would be in the book. You know what I mean? That I'm like, how, why, how come I'm the one that got to like, why, why am I the one that's got to hang out with Every, okay, wanted to meet Kiss, wanted to hang out, wanted to meet, got to introduce Gene Simmons on stage, got to hang out with him afterwards, got to actually introduce him on stage. I introduced him as the original God of Thunder. Came up, I had an hour conversation with him after the show. Conor McGregor, you know, have and have had a relationship with him online and then also 
over the years of just being, you know, a big supporter. Yeah. Getting to hang out with him, um, getting to interview him was um, on, even though it was uh, Instagram Live, it that was still counts. Five minutes. You got the content. Got the content exactly. Um, and then, and then, who else was there, babe? Who else was the last one? MJ. All the blokes from Kiss. Oh, Mike Tyson. That's a, that's <laughs> my, one you forget. That's the one I forgot because he, he he actually tried to bite me on the ear. My girl actually. We we have a photo. Me, Jenny, and Mike. Mike's in the middle, and and we've he's got our arms around us like this. And Jenny goes to him, "Man, you smell like weed." And then just as she said that, him and I started laughing and they took the picture so it's it's a great shot yep. so michael jackson mike tyson conor mcgregor and the members of kiss they're all uh, idols and and heroes of mine i suppose you could say for a lack of a better word hero is a good word i suppose but um and i've got to meet them all and interact with them all and have and have these wonderful experiences that you know like pick four of your top people in the world and, and have you hung out with them? Have you, right. have you, have you, you know what I mean? So it's, how does that keep happening to me? I'll tell you how. It's called the power of manifestation. It's the power of your mind. It's the power of wanting something, being able to see it in your mind's eye, being able to feel what it feels like to be experiencing something that you haven't experienced. Everything aligns and it will happen. I kind of always knew, even when I was a kid, that I was going to meet Michael Jackson. Now, was that just a childish thought? I'm going to meet Michael Jackson. Maybe it was, but hey, that's where it starts. Because yep. you got to be prepared for the opportunity when it comes. If, if you were in that scenario and you just got like stage fright, you're like, oh, I don't want to bother him. He's, he's probably just going to say no. Yep. You would be sitting here telling the story of the time that you saw Michael Jackson. Yeah, you know? right, exactly. And you see the way that these fans carry on when they're even in Michael's presence the fainting and the screaming and crying. That is the way not to meet Michael Jackson. If you're carrying on like that, you're never going to meet the guy. Being cool, calm and collected and not acting like a... Even though even though I was holding it in. Hey, yeah. I wanted to cry. I wanted to grab that man and I didn't want to let him go. I'm not going to lie. I wanted to cry and I wanted to kiss him, hug him. I, I didn't want to let him go. As a matter of fact, when we did say goodbye and I was hugging him, his security had to pat me on and say, okay, buddy, thanks, mate. And I was just like, okay, Mike, it was good to meet you, man. I really appreciate it. I love you. You know what I mean? It was one of those situations. Kind of lost a little bit towards the end there. <laughs> Kept it cool the whole meeting and then kind of the last five seconds maybe fanboyed out. But, hey, it was a moment in my life that I'll never forget and I'm very proud of it. Oh, my God, man. Right? I mean, yeah. it, it's, it goes to show because you talk about – having the opportunity to be in a situation like that, but also like you were manifesting it your entire life almost. Yeah. So when you got the opportunity, you knew how to act. You knew what type of behavior was going to be acceptable when you walked up to his head of security, you yep. know, like you can just be like, oh, please, please, please. Can I meet exactly. him for one second? I've been a fan my entire life. Like exactly. He, he hears that every single night on tour. Exactly. You, know? you have to have a reason. What type of value can you provide me right now to where I'd want to talk to you? So I think the value that I provided to him being the security was that I, he liked me and he wanted to do something for me. Mm -hmm. Even though he hadn't met me, he liked the way that I talked and he liked my cool approach towards him. And when someone gives you that, that you don't know, you want to you want to kind of help someone, you know what I mean? Like you want to do yeah. things for people that you don't know, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you get that energy. But yeah, man. So, uh, Michael Jackson, Gene Simmons, Mike Tyson, Conor Con McGregor. Those, are, those are not, like, niche people. Where it's like, th <laughs> they're my heroes. Like, those guys are, like, heroes mm. to Everybody, a lot yeah. of yeah. people. Like, those are big-time celebrities. And I've, I've, you know, interviewed a lot of, you know, decent... I mean, not right. public not figures, public right? figures, yeah. not, not, not as big as some of the guests, uh, that you've had, you've had some massive guests, which is always good to pluck a few. A I, think, I think we're pretty even. I'm look, I'm looking at your stuff. I see you got the content with Connor. Bob Menery is a cool guy. Bob Menery was great. Really big platform. Unbelievable platform. And, um, just such a cool guy. Uh, and I'm in, I'm in a great place now with my show. Finally, after I took a bit of a break, had about a year and a half off kind of lost the passion a bit you know when you go from yeah. when you go from as we discussed earlier on sitting in your home in your bedroom shooting with a you know no equipment to getting a studio then losing the studio and going back to where you first came from i i couldn't i couldn't accept that i couldn't so what happened i just lost all my funding yeah. i just lost my sponsorship i lost my funding and 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 
I wasn't. I just couldn't afford it. I just. I was making zero money. Um, I was putting a lot of money into it, and it just wasn't getting any return. And and, and in the end, when I lo- once I lost a couple of the sponsors, it was just like, fuck, this studio is just too expensive for me to run on my own without any help. Mm-hmm. So once kind of that went out the window, and I went back home and I tried to do Zoom meetings, and I was just saying to my girl, I'm like, I just like this fucking sucks, man. I, it's okay every now and then. Like if we were to do a zoom in here right now in this environment with this sound and the lighting and everything like that, yeah, it'd be cool. But when you're just, it's okay every now and then. So I was just like, you know what, fuck it, I've lost the passion. I, I just, I just, I couldn't be bothered. And then, um, and then I got a phone call from a guy who owns a company called Celebrity Boxing. Um, they've had Kim Kardashian. They've had, I mean, a bunch of. She's probably a what? Who? Yeah, the Jersey, one of the girls from Jersey Shore, not her, one of them, and a bunch of those kind of celebrities where they they fight each other and right, reality so TV kind of they just dramatize things. Yeah, yeah. so they contacted me and Real said, Housewives. Yeah, all that kind yeah. of shit. They got a hold of me and said, "Would you be interested in fighting? Would you have you ever had a fight before? We love that you kind of do the whole Conor McGregor thing and you kind of look like him. Would you like to fight a kind of troll?" It's like, absolutely, I would love to fight a kind of troll. As a matter of fact, and I'm thinking to myself. Get back out in the public eye again. It's a pay per view. It's on Fight TV on Triller. Fucking ten grand. Why not? I'll do it. Got my coach back on. I said, "Hey, these guys, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna do it. We're going to camp." Just publicizing me everywhere. I'm on Instagram. Hey, I'm gonna fight. I got this fight coming up. Her mum's freaking out. My mum's freaking out. I was like, "What the fuck are you doing? You're 53 years old. Why are you getting into the ring?" Well, I just wanted to get myself back out there and do something instead yeah. of just sitting on the fucking couch smoking weed all day doing nothing. Because once again. I'd lost the passion. I'd lost the drive. I'd lost the urge. And I didn't know what the fuck I was going to do. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll just put it all into my fitness. I'll put it into my body. I'm going to train hard. I'm going to get ripped as fuck. I'm going to juice up. I'm going to get in this ring. I'm going to fucking slay this guy. I'm going to be all right again. Third week into camp. Snap my Achilles. So, fuck, fights off. Mm-hmm. Fights off. But I didn't say anything. I was like, all right, let me just I'll lay low. I'll leave it for a month. <laughs> Uh, I heard it snap. I actually heard it sound like a rubber band. And I just thought, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll lay low for a month. I'll ice it. I'll stay off it. Fight will be good. And I did that. Day I went back, spa day. I'm getting to fight someone. End of the first round. Fucking snap. It goes again. Had to call him and tell him that the fight was off. Get all the shit done with my Achilles. And then that week... A guy that owns a studio in town wanted to meet up with me and said, we'd love you to come and shoot your show down at Sticky Paws Studios. We want to take care of it. We want to produce it. We want to do everything that you haven't been doing. And um, we're going to take care of everything. We just want you part of the team. And then from that moment on, that was like six weeks ago. And I've put out more content in six weeks than I have in fucking two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it's been good. Getting a few sponsors on board. And uh, getting back in the mix of it, you know, getting down to the apex, going to uh, the contender series, trying to get a bit more involved yeah. in, the, in, in uh, Power Slap, um, you know, doing my podcast. I want to do a little bit more commentating. I know Mike Perry's got an MMA promotion that he's going to bring out soon. So I've hit them up for a gig and they're going to let me know um, once they start auditioning for announcers, if they do. And um, I actually did one um, pay-per-view commentary where... Uh, and it's the first one I ever did. Fucking throat was sore the next day, I'll tell you that. Were you just like an analyst with like a play-by-play guy? So or? I was watching it and in the studio yeah. and, and, the, and everyone was watching it on YouTube, but just obviously just seeing me right. and, and hearing my... And I really, really enjoyed it. So I want to do another one of those. And um, yeah, man, I had a company approach me about doing being a... Uh, what do you call it? A show critic. Oh, okay. So they pay you to go and watch a show and then write a piece on it and upload it and maybe shoot an interview with one of the cast and they're like, yeah, it's, uh, will you, I'm like, actually, I'd be pretty good at that because I I love entertainment and I've been in the entertainment industry for a long time. So anyway, fuck, I'm just chatting away here, aren't I? I mean, the opportunities are endless. I want, I definitely want to learn more about that because that's, that's like everybody's dream is to say, watch a, a movie, write a blog or an article about it and then talk to the cast about it. You know, that's what a lot of my buddies who broke into the quote unquote reporting and interview space did. They go to all these 
you know, premieres and have junket interviews, five, 10, 15 minute interviews with cast members. And then they use all of that for content. Absolutely. And then you build relationships with those cast members when you go back for like their next movie, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's all about networking and throwing your feelers out there. I actually saw that gig on a job website and I saw it and I thought, oh, that looks cool. And like two months ago and I just applied and didn't think anyway, they got back to me the other day and said, hey, are you interested in still being a critic? You can bring someone with you. You know, it's the money. Listen, the money's not massive, but. No, but you're getting the exposure of meeting all of these big people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which like the kid in you is like, this is what I wanted to do. I want to meet my heroes. I want to meet my idols, you know, which you've been able to do already. But it's like to be able to meet like. Uh, I was trying to think. The other day, there was the movie, the movie Iron Claw is coming out with Zac Efron uh, about the. Uh, I don't know. You kind of look a little bit like him. Do you get told that? Kind of. And you also kind of look a little bit like Daniel Radcliffe as well. Do you get that, that one? I get a lot. Unfortunately, I got to shave. You, you, you. I don't really. I remember growing up, I always like had my hair parted a little bit. And my mom put me on a pedestal and always said I looked like Leo DiCaprio. Oh, really? So I always just rode that my enti- like going into adulthood, and people were like, "No, you look like uh, Harry Potter." Yeah. I'm like that's not good. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say a slash between. I'd say a slash between Daniel Ratcliffe, Bob Mennery, and 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 who, babe? Bradley Cooper. And Bradley I'll Cooper, a little bit. I'll take that. Hang on, babe. That's a good one. The eyes, yeah. He's got the, the piercingly blue eyes. Blue and you, eyes, you've yeah. been about all the... Are you married or you got a girlfriend? I don't, but I get complimented. Last night I was at a party, got complimented on my eyes. Oh, my God. You got the... Oh, my over. God. You have beautiful eyes. Yep. Cheryl, great come look at his eyes. Come look at his eyes. And Literally. You know, you got that. two on the end of it. That's right. That's how it works. Usually. It is. It is. It's, it's a great conversation starter. It is. To say the least. Absolutely. Nice. No, that's, that's, uh, I'm, I, I checked out your content. I like what you're doing. And what, what really impresses me about you is, um, your age and how you're jumping on this so early in life, um, which is a, such a great start for you because look what you've done already. How, what are you, 807? Yeah. Eight, 807 something like what was it 804 805 i forget what i said i'm gonna have to i mean we'll probably that, have to edit it later because i'm probably gonna mess it up it was like 802 and then i'm gonna say it's 807 who knows yeah uh i mean that's just incredible like you you have are doing what a lot of people want to do and you're putting out good quality stuff as well and that's the main thing you get you get good views you got decent following and uh fair play to you i i, I like I, I don't come it's good coming on a podcast because I'm always on the other side of it. Yeah. So when you get to, and this is only the second one I've, I believe maybe the third one I've ever done. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's not, I mean, I guess I've only been on like three or four other, other shows for other people too. And it, it's easy because you can just riff and tell stories all the time. Like the second I connected with you, I'm like, Oh, I love interviewing other people that interview people. Cause we could just tell stories for yeah. hours at a time. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely a fun way to earn a living. Do you do anything else aside from this? So I got into this by being a sports commentator. Yep. So right. I worked with ESPN Plus when I was in college. Uh, have dabbled in doing opportunities with Fox Sports and you know other teams alike. A huge baseball guy. So I was a play-by-play commentator for baseball teams, college level, minor leagues, mm. all of that. And that's still something I definitely You're very good for. at that. I checked out yeah. one of your videos on YouTube when I saw the uh Oh, that's right. I do e- have some of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I saw the ESPN logo, I was like, "Whoa, very good." So, that's great. So, you work for ESPN Radio or something like that? So, in college, we were affiliated with ESPN Plus, which I guess is their streaming service. Yeah, I, we have that. So, our college, so I went to Grand Canyon University, and our teams would be broadcasted on ESPN Plus, which was great because we got to interact with all their producers and all the directors and all their camera people, and you got to say, welcome inside on ESPN Plus, and I'm like an 18-year-old kid freshman year. Just to be able yeah. to even say that is huge mm-hmm. for your resume. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, and it's just like the dream, because I remember when I was five years old growing up watching New York Yankee games back in New Jersey, I'm like, mm. these guys get paid to talk about baseball on tv right who wouldn't want to do that and i knew right then and there that's what i want to pursue and then the podcast kind of just like partnered with it because when i was in i was 16 17 years old i'm like 
this was like before the podcast wave too, where I was mm. just like, nobody can tell me not to do that. I could have my own talk show, interview people. You yeah. know, you grow up watching the Tonight Show with like Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, Conan, like all those guys. I'm like, I, I got my own talk show. Yep. And I was telling you before we started, I started by having my guests call in on my phone, and I had an iPad with an app called Voice Memos, where I would just click that when the guests was ready to go on the phone. Did that for the first two years out of college in a conference room next to my dorm room. I remember having, um, it was Bobby Abreu, used to play for the Philadelphia Phillies, Yankees a little bit, Mets, kind of went around. I remember him calling me the morning of when we were supposed to do the interview, being like, so I can fly in. Uh, where's your studio at? And I'm thinking, like, I'm not, I'm not 18 years old, like, in my bunk bed in my in my college room, thinking, like, uh, <laughs> we could just do it over the phone if you want. That might be easier for you. He's like, yeah, that might be easier. I'll do that. I'm, and I'm thinking, like, a chopper flying around my camp campus university. Yeah. Being like, yeah, come to my dorm room. Um, it was just, like, having those cool, unique experiences and opportunities to connect with people early on and people saw what you build because like you could do a podcast for a year nobody was really impressed especially in this day and age but like oh you're still doing it seven eight years later Mm -hmm. and you've interviewed now like magic johnson or cheech and chong or like all these just wide variety this is you you're saying this personally yeah right did you um how do you get your guests have built relationships from the ground up since I started. So I remember reaching out to people just over email because on Instagram you could list your email, you could list your phone number if you want to. Mm. And I would just click email on people that I thought I want to interview them. It didn't matter if they were Michael Jackson level famous where I knew like they're probably not going to respond to me at the time with no experience. You think like, Oh, if their emails listed, sure. They're going to respond. And I remember think I remember getting in touch with a few different publicists telling me right off the bat, like, not likely, but we'll let you know when they're doing press stuff or stuff yeah. like that. And I would always follow up, like, once a month, just checking in, would love any opportunities I, I could have. Mm. And I was able to build relationships with two or three really cool publicists, both in Major League Baseball as well as in the music industry that gave me some opportunities early on just to be a fly on the wall for things, whether it was, like, in the clubhouse at a baseball stadium, just – kind of watching how everybody else does it and getting to throw in a question or there. Um, I had a few opportunities early on for like some Skype calls with some guys like Corey Taylor from Slipknot. Right, he, he yeah. was like He was like the first singer I think I interviewed that I like grew up listening to. Wow. That was the one where I was like, oh my God, it's Corey Taylor. And I get to talk to him. He's just like, what do you want to talk about? I'm like, I had nothing prepared. I was just like asking like a few questions off the top of my head. Like, I think we talked about like Chris Cornell and Soundgarden, like Mm -hmm. some of his inspirations growing up. Yeah. But I'm like, this is like, I'm getting the reps in. I'm getting Mm -hmm. the, while also building these relationships by being like down to earth, knowing that like right now I'm not going to get every opportunity I want, but I'm going to make the most of the opportunities that they're going to present to me you uh because you've got a like a nice disposition about you and your energy is like calm uh people are drawn to that and they're they're going back to what i said before they want to give people opportunities they want you know what i mean like man i know a couple of podcasters that just just have no idea what you know what i mean and i was one of them Mm -hmm. but it's all about them and you know they want the camera time and it's just no idea on how to talk to people and to let people talk and, you know, how to guide the podcast and, you know, how to take it away from maybe if it's going down a direction that's making the guest uncomfortable, how to change that, how to be able to cover fuck ups or maybe um, uncomfortable pauses. Or There's a lot that goes into it. And I suppose just being a good conversationalist like yourself and being able to, and doing it over and over and over and over and over again. Oh, well, I always tell people, it's going to sound like a broken record too. I, I am a total introvert. You know, when I first started the show, I always wanted to be a talk show host. But, like, I remember telling my parents, being like, are you sure that's what you want to get into? Because you say two words to us at the dinner table. Every yeah. Time. Like, I didn't talk. Mm. I, didn't, I, grew, I grew my social skills, my, my conversationalist skills, if you will, building this platform and connecting with so many different people. And the more people you meet, the more personalities you meet, you realize how diverse the world actually is outside mm-hmm. of, like – the suburbs of New Jersey where I grew up. Right. It's like everybody's different. And when you can relate to everybody with a different backstory and mm. different, different things that make them click and trigger them, like 
you're going to be well versed and very successful, I think, because you can communicate well. I found that one of the things that happened with me when I first started podcasting my first season of studio work, I found it very difficult to watch after I'd shot them. Yeah. I would, I just, I didn't like watching myself. I didn't, it, it felt good at the time when I was doing the podcast, but then when I went back and watched it, I was just like, oh, fuck, I just, I hated it. I just, I, like there wasn't one that I really ever enjoyed watching, maybe one or two, but since I've moved into this new space and had this little bit of a break, um, I can actually watch myself now. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely a learning curve. Oh, isn't you know? it? We're like at this point, I feel like I, I definitely am way more confident looking back or it's like four or five years ago. Absolutely mm. not. I still have audio on my phone mixed in. I'll have it set on random in the car where it'll be like, all right, Taylor Swift, Foo Fighters, Slipknot. And then, like, one of my first 10 podcast episodes was like, welcome to the O Show. I'm like, oh, no, no, go, go back, go back, go back. You know, it, I came out, I'm like, where did that come from? You know, it's like when you have the ox in the car, like you have the ox in your home and you're just playing music in the background when you're having, like, a dinner party. All of a sudden, all they hear is, welcome back. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, how'd that get in there? You know, it's like from like five, six, seven years ago. I'm yeah. like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I got to yeah. go back and delete those files. Oh, no, you want to keep them because, you know, once again, it's good to, to reflect on where you came from, you know, and it'd be good to do a little compilation, you know, <laughs> um, from where you started to where you are, which is just leaps and bounds. But it's like everyone, you know, you always get better the more you do it. So. Oh, yeah. job, and I'm job. with you when you're talking about, you know, having a great studio to shoot out of and then going back to like Zoom or just like over the phone, like you're not motivated by that. No. You know, well, like we I've had experiences where like I had to leave certain studios and then go back and it's like it kind of definitely messes with your your psyche <laughs> and your flow and your 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 ebb flow of just of momentum when you're fucking stopping and starting and having a and then going to a different you got to have consistent momentum consistency and momentum mm -hmm. which builds success because you yeah. just you just you got to be putting out a good product obviously and mm -hmm. you've got to be talented at what you do but the more consistent and the more momentum that you get and it just takes that one fuck bro it can take one sentence to go viral it can take one guest it can take one minute it can take one moment and the next thing you know the whole fucking world knows who you are and your life can change that's the beauty of this industry shit like that can happen you know what i mean like um it's it's very very possible mm -hmm. and having the high quality production of course tenfold and because people look at that they really do. They look at it and, and, and it makes a difference. I don't care what anyone says. You're set and you're sound, particularly. You have to have quality sound beyond uh, beyond quality. And then, of course, you got to have a great set like this one here. Mm -hmm. I nearly, I was going to pick this off and start yeah, smoking it, but I don't know. I don't know. You can get cancer <laughs> from this plastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, I, I mean, this place is like a hidden gem. No, oh, it's great. I mean, I am very thankful for Ivan, Spencer, Bonix, everybody that's allowed me to shoot some episodes here. Some of my best episodes came out of here. I think I have like three or four episodes out of here. They're some of my favorite episodes. Nice. Yeah, you know? that's great. Yeah, no, I checked out the set before I came on today. And um, yeah, no, it looks amazing. looks good on TV, on the big screen. And then like Sticky Paws, where you shoot at, mm. is incredible, an incredible team as well. And it's crazy. Not many people would know this about Sticky Paws, but they shoot with iPhones. Yeah. Which is crazy because the content is really good, really high quality. So now there's about 60 podcasts that shoot out of Sticky Paws Studios. 60. So they are just busy, nonstop. Yeah, but they and bring on their clientele, which is cool. Yeah. Um, you've actually interviewed one of the guys that shoots his podcast there, Sean. Sean Kelly. Sean Kelly. I noticed that you... Um, spoke to him and yeah he shoots his podcast there there's a bunch of great podcasts in there so yeah it's a great it's great to be around there and you're motivated being around other people because it's, i don't there's always healthy competition and you know you got to have a bit of healthy competition and i like that it keeps me um on my feet i mean everybody 
and again, I have always said growing up on the East Coast and then moving out here, it is everybody is just like competing against each other Mm -hmm. back there in New York and Boston and Philly. We're out here like, yeah, everybody wants to be the best, but everybody is so helpful. Sean Kelly. Yep. So Sean Kelly actually grew up 20 minutes from where I was in New Jersey growing up as kids, Mm. which is we found that out when we met a little uh, last year, earlier this year. Um, And he, he shows the number one marketing podcast in the world. He started it nine months ago. But he still is very much just like, hey, man, like I just had this guest on. I think it would be great for your show. Or like I'll have a guest be like, oh, you've been on Sean's show? Let me introduce you to Sean. Like mm-hmm. everybody helps each other out. You know, that's just yeah. one example. Yeah. Um, no, and that's a good part about it. And I like Sean. He, I, I mean, what a platform that guy. People pay to go on his podcast. Oh, yeah. They have to pay to go on there. I think he's charging $5,000 per guest right now, and he's doing roughly around 30 to 40 paid guests a month. So just do the math there. Um, Life I'll let you money. do it. Can you do the math? <laughs> so I, I, I had lunch with him the other day. He's making a little over $180,000 a month right yeah, now just on paid guests. Good for him. You know, he, he knows how to market himself. Maybe I need to talk to him. I wonder a, if he'll charge me. It's a very me. special skill set to have. I'd like to know, like, can you give me, like, just give me fucking 10 minutes. That's all I need. Give me 10 minutes to say as much as you can. I'm going to record it on my phone. Just, 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 you know, help help a brother out. Help an Aussie brother out mm-hmm. there, Sean. Exactly. Um, but you know what? I'm doing everything on my own. When I say on my own, my girl, she helps me with, before I went into the studio, because they literally do everything now, even make my clips. Yep. They upload it to all the platforms. They, we, we, there's no editing in mine. We just, how we shoot it is how it comes out. And then um, Jenny helps me a lot with a lot of the stuff from home. And she's very technical. I'm not. I was born in the 70s. So I'm not, you know, not technically inclined. You got to adapt though. I know. I'm, I'm getting better. Getting much, much better. But um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that conversation. But, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, man. Sticky Paws is great. There's a lot of podcasts in there and I'm, 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 I'm happy to be part of their team. It's great. Yeah. John Orlando's a good guy. Have you been down there? Uh, I have once. Yeah. I checked it out. John Orlando, a guy I need to schedule a podcast with. I was supposed to have John Orlando in here over the summer, and then he, I guess, was up all night playing poker and just like uh, he's the ki- he's the king. Yeah. He's uh, him and Dana White stay up playing poker all night. Mm-hmm. You got John's number, right? So you I spoke do. to him. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, John. John's a great guest. He's a uh, successful businessman. You know, and down to earth too. Down to earth, know. not a dickhead. You know, you know who his father is, right? Oh, I know, Tony. Yeah. Right? Tony Orlando. Yeah. yeah. So no, John. John. John has been a like a guardian angel for me. He literally came out of nowhere and put my career back on track. Mm. Like literally went everything that you fought so hard to pay for and get done that was lost. I'm gonna do it all for you come over here and shoot your podcast and 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 i was like well how many how many can i do like how many podcasts can i shoot he goes well how many can you do a week i was like i don't know he goes do as many as you want so i can shoot one two three four five a week if i want so it's just a blessing to have the facility to be able to just you know reach out to guests and Fucking have yeah. it done. Just like You're that. doing your part, which is just talking. Yep. And then everything else is taken care of for you. So, like for me, and I love the process. I love you know being behind how the sausage is made in that sense. You know all the meat and potatoes behind it, where I edit my own stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, make all the clips, and I enjoy the process. Yep. Yep. But like every now and then, I'm like, I should delegate all this stuff. You know, like it would save so much time. So much time and energy. I was telling the last guest, like, sometimes I go brain dead sometimes. Or, like, I can't even look at my phone for a week. Oh, Jenny says it to me all the time. She's like, well, you get off your phone. It's like 10 hours now. Your eyes are looking really, really messed up. I'm like, no, it's because I'm stoned. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, um, yeah, it's, it's like, say for a one-minute clip where you put pop-ups in it. So, for instance, did you, have you, did you seen any of my clips where the little... So, for instance, I did one with um, Bob Menery talking about his movie with Conor McGregor and little pop-up clip here and there and in the one-minute clips. Oh, they, yeah, you got to have... They, yeah, they you take, have it takes a minute, man, to yeah. get the pictures, to download the picture, to remove the background from the picture, to get it exactly to where it is on time, then to pop that picture up, then to put it back down, and then sometimes you fuck it up and, ah, uh, do two or three of those. Yeah. 
His edibles just kicked in. I can tell right now. Look. Yeah. 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 What's going on over yeah, there? Yeah, it's the edibles. Definitely. We should have had some edibles before we started. I had a little smoke before I came. Just to, you know. You were all prepared. I was all prepared, but that's all that good. I, I actually purposely wore the sunglasses because my eyes looked like his. <laughs> Um, he, he, you know, but so I, I'm a bit older, so the wrinkles pop out when I'm, I got my stone dyes on. But yeah, it's all good in the hood. It's all good. Yeah. Again, we're gonna go downstairs after this too. I, I want to see what what new toys you guys are playing with down there. Nice. Uh, but yeah, there's just so many cool people and cool opportunities that you get through podcasting that mm. you wouldn't get anywhere else. So have you? Do you do any? Um, do you get media credentials and do any media stuff? Yep. So through my go back to ESPN build, Plus, building, absolutely building, building some of those relationships. You get invited to things, so like big baseball guys. So the MLB winter meetings every year, you get to interact with general managers and free agents that are signing with teams, and mm-hmm. of course all of their media personnel from all the big ESPN, Fox, all the local stations all come and. It's a cool tight knit community of people that I grew up watching on TV that. I can now text and be like, "You coming this year?" It's like, "Yeah, let's let's connect." Isn't that a bizarre? Which is so cool, and it's so easy too. Like once you get into it, mm-hmm. people respect your work. It's mm-hmm. like you're all friends, and it's like it was supposed to happen. This no, way. no, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, you know, same as you. You got to build good relationships, and I got a great publicist from Iridium Sports Management who has like over two hundred of the fighters of the UFC on the UFC mm-hmm. roster. So I get all their fighters. Um, now I'm getting in more to the the BKFC, the bare knuckle boxing. I'm interviewing yeah. a lot of them. So I got my media creds for the Mike Perry, Eddie Alvarez fight December 2nd. So I'm doing my first media fucking event where I'm going to be asking questions at the press conference. And oh, that's in, so it's my first one ever. I've ever, I've never done one before. So I'm really nervous, but um, you know, I know I'll, I'll be able to execute and pull it off, but even still just, doing something for the first time is but yeah so and then i want to get more into the power slap dana white's power slap have you watched that how many events does he put on so at the moment they're in the second season of the reality show and then the next event will be in january is it yeah and what do they do they do 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 it it at the the apex apex. yeah now i haven't seen one live yet but i'm just starting to get into the sport and it's just mind-blowing i mean i see the slow motion footage of guys just breaking their faces well the thing is is that what the footage that you see is all the knockouts but they're not all knockouts sometimes they're going back and forth at each other for the full round which i believe it's three slaps each or something something don't quote me on that but it's gnarly man Mm. you imagine that I couldn't imagine being there. I mean, watching it in person, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But like, I couldn't imagine wanting to volunteer and do that. I don't care how much money is yeah. on the table. Have you ever Have you ever covered a combat sport event? I have one MMA event. I did play by play for it was like an amateur uh, MMA event in Phoenix mm. about a year and a half. You enjoy ago. it? Loved it. And then th- through that, I got an opportunity to call some pro wrestling matches, which is very interesting because it's like you almost have to play a character, even right. as a commentator. No, I heard your voice. I thought you did a great job. You you uh, fucking reminding me of Bob Menery again, just the yeah. way that he does you, his. You got to have like a certain tone yep. when you're calling. And you him, you have the, you have the same as him. Honestly, doesn't his voice sound a little similar to? Yeah. Mm. I think so. But even like even he like obviously he puts turns it, it on. Oh like, yeah, big too. time. But like when he's just talking to you on your show, it's like okay, like that's just Bob's voice. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. But he once again when he turns it on, he's very talented at what he does. And have oh, you seen yeah. his Instagram? How he does the oh, funny play by yeah. plays with yeah. Oh my! It's so. I mean, he what used is- to do that out of the back of his car when he had nothing. You know, like try telling your parents. He had to tell his parents like, "This is what I want to do with my life." And he was living in the back of his car for I don't know how long, but it was a humble beginning. And then all all of a sudden, it took off on social media. And he was he was the guy in that space for like two, three, four years there. Yep, he was the main guy of Nelk. He was the one that was bringing in all the guests. And uh, I don't know. I sensed a little sadness in him. He he. he oh yeah. He would say. Road. Yeah, I I definitely could sense some sadness in the guy, and I felt kind of bad. Um, but you know, he seems resilient as fuck. Who's a guest that you've had on that was just like an amazing human being to get to know 
even if it was just for like the hour of you interviewing them and who was someone that just turned out to be a total like disappointment like Stitch Duran was an unbelievable human being. Mm. You know who Stitch is? I don't. So he's one of the he's the most famous world famous cut man. He's done all the big fights from Joe Frazier and you know, he was in the uh, one of the Rocky movies and Oh wow. So he would he's one of the world famous cut men. He was unbelievable. I think he nearly made me cry. Um I had a amazing lady who came on my podcast her name was Susie and she was the makeup artist for the UFC so she would fix everybody up before their interviews and very well loved everybody loved her she had stage four cancer and she was trying to beat it holistically so she decided not to go through chemotherapy and all the horrible you know medicines that they do to try and but she I mean when she had she she had it everywhere she had it in her breasts, in her lungs. She had it in her bones. I mean, she had it everywhere. And she came in and we did the podcast together. And her positivity and her outlook on her beating this disease was... It just fucking floored me. I was blown away by the strength of this woman because... I would have been fucking falling apart. Mm-hmm. So she was trying all these different medicine, uh, holistic medicines and shamans and just a whole bunch of things and came on. And so she really broke my heart. And then 12 weeks later, she passed away. Mm. Yeah. So, and then, um, fuck, who else? Another one that actually passed away was a man called Steve Loft. Steve Loft was Mike Tyson's right-hand man through the glory years. Wow. The glory is, and he came on and told me some incredible stories about Mike and back in the day, and yeah, um, he was he was great. And who who was who was an asshole? I wouldn't say an asshole, but but just like someone that really didn't meet your expectation. Like they were a lot different than what I thought they were going to be. Even if they were just like wired differently, you guys just didn't connect. Um, well, Tommy Lee from Motley Crue spat water on me before I even got a chance to ask him a question. So is so, musicians. So, Dave Matthews broke my phone once. What did he do? Pick it up and throw it? He, like, slapped it out of my hand. For what? So the backstory there is that it was at a uh, music festival. So they call it the Innings Fest in Arizona. Baseball partners with, like, rock bands, basically. It was, like, Dave Matthews, Weezer... Uh, like an Ozfest. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You have like 50 bands show up. But he was the headliner, and I was there as a beat reporter for the in- Innings Fest. And I guess all of the publicists for all the bands that we all got contact sheets for didn't want anything recorded with audio, just like basically pen and paper. If you wanted to ask anything, that way you could put it in the article. So they didn't want anything going up on audio. I didn't get that memo. So he, I immediately, I'm like, oh, Mr. Matthews, like, put my phone up with, like, the voice thing. And he kind of just, like, looked at it and slapped it out of my hand. And I, I'm watching it fall in, like, slow motion. Just, like, splat right on the face. Just cracked everywhere. And I'm like, oh, shit. Picked up my phone immediately. Just, like, asked the questions I wanted to ask two, three questions, was done, and he just walked away. It was like in a scrum, too, with like three or four different people, and they were all like, what the hell? You know? And here's the kicker. Dave Matthews Band, there's people that like love that band, there's people that hate that band. My family, besides for me, loves Dave Matthews. So when Love, I to- loved. So when, so when I text them, they're like, well, did you piss him off? What did you do? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's the one that smashed my phone, you know? But they they still love Dave Matthews. And then I went to the show afterwards. I'm like, this is a pretty good concert. But yeah, he he was one where I'm like, okay, he was a little bit off. When I interviewed Kevin Lee, he's a UFC fighter. And I used to get product from Proper 12, which is Conor McGregor's right. whiskey. They would send me cases of whiskey and I would give them to my guests on the podcast a lot of the times I would do a shot with them and then we would, you know, I wanted to get content and Connor would always repost it and Proper 12 would repost it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so 
So I got the bottle and I and I, I used to I used to call it the passing of the prop ass. I say, for instance, you're my guest. I'll be like, this is the part of the show where, you know, I like to present my guest with a bottle of the finest, tastiest whiskey. This is what we call passing of the proper. I go to give it to Kevin Lee and he's like, no, nah, I don't want that. I don't want that shit. I was like, oh, he goes, you want me to promote that? You got to pay me 10 grand, 10 grand right now. And I was like, oh, okay, no, no. I was like, oh, look, you can just have it anyway. He goes, ah, all right. I was like, well, look, just do a shot with us. And he goes, all right. So I, I pour some whiskey in his, pour some whiskey in mine. Uh, yeah, proper 12. And as we go to cheers it, he just fucking tips it out like that on the floor. Just tipped it out like that. And that was one of the only times I actually cut something out of the podcast. Right, because that's a bad look on proper 12. Well, I reached you know? out to the marketing guy there and I said, hey, listen, this happened. It would probably get a little go, you know, I could probably make it go viral a bit. But would you prefer I cut it out? And they said, yeah, chop it out. So I chopped it out. But I've always pretty much had good experiences with everyone that I've mm-hmm. that I've interviewed. Um, Themba Garimbo was a little tough. He's another UFC fighter. Um, I feel like most UFC fighters, I know I've interviewed a few, like Justin Gaethje. Mm. I had the opportunity. Oh, yeah, he'd be a tough with. interview. He's just, you could tell he's like same yep. all over the place, yep. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I've I've had pretty good experiences with everybody. I always get a good laugh. I always have a good laugh with my guests. You know, we always have some food and have a couple of drinks. Although I don't drink alcohol anymore, and um, but yeah, I I always try to do that non common question podcast that you get from every other MMA journalist. I try to like if i can make my guests cry or get watery eyed i know it's been a successful podcast mm. if i can get them to open up about stuff that when they i love it when they say okay i'm going to talk about something i've never talked about this before i'm always thinking ching right there that's a good one or if i look at them in the eye and i see their eyes are welling up and i'll encourage you know i'm seeing a bit of an emotion in your eye there you know this really affects you doesn't it and you you know you, i i i think my skill if i want to say it's a skill is the ability to be able to draw personal things out of people without them, well, not without them realizing that I'm doing it, but I just have the ability to make people feel comfortable enough to where they want to talk to me about things. And especially when I, you know, mentioned that I've had many struggles over the years with with lots of different things, you know, um, booze and drugs being one of them. Once they, you know, you show a bit of vulnerability, people open up, man. Mm -hmm. People do. And these fighters can be tough sometimes, dude. Real hard to interview. You want to build up your interview skills? Go, go interview a few of these fighters. The walls are just up. Yeah, and it, but I always down. crack it down like yeah. that. Well, I was talking about that that Thamba guy. He's from Zimbabwe. He's the one that the Rock bought a house for, and just very, very staunch. Very like he would. I, I knew when he was going to finish the question that it would be for, uh, the answer. He would talk, talk, talk. And then pause, and I'm thinking, I'm trying to make him laugh, and I'm like, you know, your dad in Zimbabwe, don't call it dad, call it father. We don't call dad, and I'm like, okay, real difficult. But then, then the, the the key that turned it around was when I said, I bet you the animals in my country are way scarier than the animals in your country. And he's like, once he realised I was from Australia, then we started talking about animals, and we were good, mm-hmm. and it kind of opened it up. And uh, he was, he was, uh, yeah. There's the Aussie thing. I bet you the animals in my country are yeah. scarier than the ones in yours. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was it. And then he opened well, up. Well, that's a, different. Yeah. You know, so. where most reporters are asking the same fight-based questions. Mm. I mean, you have to open them up, talk about things that they actually enjoy talking yeah. about. Yeah. Like if you – one of my idols getting into podcasting was Chris Jericho. So pro wrestler, rock star, whatever. He's like – he had a podcast with Slash one day. And Slash is like, I don't want to talk about Axel or Guns N' Roses. This is when they were broken up or whatever. And that's what reporters do. They always ask him about Guns N' Roses, the breakup. He's like, I have Slash from Guns N' Roses in my studio for the next hour. Like, we could talk about anything that he wants. Who, mm-hmm. who, ca- who cares about the stuff that you already see 10 10- thousand different reporters talk about he's like we just talked about ninja turtles for the first 30 minutes of the interview because he likes ninja turtles you know nobody else is going to have that content exactly and that's the key and people don't realize that and it's such a blatant skill to be able to maybe even do a bit of like a lot of podcasters when people and trust me guys believe it when 
podcasters say, no, I just go in there and we have a conversation. Bullshit. Every, every podcaster Everything's does. Everything's calculated. You have to do a bit of research on your guests. And if you don't, then you're a fool. But you want to do some research and find out things that aren't really asked or whatever. And I do this new segment in my show, which is quite funny. Um, <laughs> and you should try it maybe one day. It's, it's really, really uh, gets the guests laughing. As I pull out AI chat and I say, give me a subject. And I say to my guests, give me a subject whatever it is and it will say um uh, uh, a leopard head guy with a broken arm and let's get ai to make a rap out of it and then you're gonna rap it so that's, that's let's what, actually do that right yeah, now so why not yeah i i have uh, my best friend right here chat smith all right i'll i'll let you pick a topic all right let's go uh australian lizards in Ireland. Oh, this is going to be a banger. So this is a, this this segment can go two ways. One way it can be very entertaining. The other way it could end up on the cutting room floor. All right. So how do we do this? So th- what I normally do is is that I go to chat. I uh, I put it in and it just gave me like a paragraph worth of. So you have to ask for them to write a rap. So do you, do you use this one? Chat AI? Yep. Chat AI, give me a rap about a Australian lizard in Ireland. All right, so let's see what how we go. All right. They're like, we're on it. So you have lyrics now, and you have verses. Mate, you can have l- limericks, you can have... L- l- Dude, that's like a 10-minute song. All right. What do we sure, do? here's a rap about an Australian lizard in Ireland down under to the Emerald Isle. A lizard came with style, with scales so green and eyes so bright, he stood out in the night. <laughs> From the outback in the rolling hills, he explored with the thrills. In Ireland's misty weather, he found a brand new fucking adventure. Chilling in Dublin, sipping on Guinness, the Aussie lizard ain't here to mess with. He got the moves like a kangaroo. Hope so, he's fucking smooth. From Sydney to Dublin, he's got something to prove. Crossing fields and leaping fences. He's breaking barriers. No pretenses. <laughs> so anyway, you that got, way too you've got, long. you've got the, dude, it goes, you, there's three fucking songs in that. Uh, if you ask me, <laughs> see, I'm thinking, it's uh, crazy. Thank- Nobody really has to do anything anymore. Uh, like for someone to create that, that would take months yeah. to write a song about Australian lizards in Ireland. You see what I mean? Isn't it bizarre? And the good thing about it is, is that when you get the uh, guests to, uh, to wrap it, it's just a real icebreaker and it's hilarious and it's funny and it's... Has yeah. anybody not reacted well to it? No. <laughs> that's awesome. No. That's so cool. Uh, it's a pretty new segment, but um, yeah, it's it's something that's fun and something that's different. Especially and, when you get rappers in there. Yeah. They'll have a good time. I haven't it. had a rapper yet. That would be nice. Yeah. Rappers are the nicest people. I think you guys had Wiz Khalifa in here at one point, right? Was he smoking it up Bonics. in here? Was it Hell cloudy yeah. as fuck in here? Yeah. Nice. So how does that work with ventilation and everything in here? Not. Nah. Oh, they've got the oh, ventilation got machines. The, that sucks all the smoke up. That's smart because a lot of studios don't have that. That's great. Yeah, that's nice. Like I Mike like Tyson's that. got his hot boxing podcast at the Win Now. Is that, is that where it is? I mean, he shoots in that studio. Right. A lot of a, a lot of content creators shoot, but he basically wanted to do his hot boxing show there, and they're like, "You can't smoke in here," and they're like, "But that's the whole premise of my show." And it, so it didn't happen? Yeah. So he's recording there. He just doesn't smoke when he records out of there. He just chomps down those mushies. Yeah. Did you see on the Full Send podcast when he ate all those mushrooms? Mm-hmm. Have, you ever, tr- have you ever tried mushrooms before? No. Yeah. Don't want to. No. It was a horrible experience. I did it once. I fucking hated it. Hated it. No, I'm not, I don't like to see shit that, that's not... Oh, I don't yeah. like to see shit moving that's not moving. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like you almost like have something like in your skin crawling, and you can't like really do anything about it. And it can't, it's there for a minute. You know what I mean? You're in for a bit of a haul when you take mushrooms or any kind of psychedelics. I'm hearing. You know, you're you're in for the fucking long haul. If you're freaked out, 
You know what I mean? Like, I, I knew this buddy of mine. Check this out. This is a fucking scary story. His name's Ben. I don't know where you are, Ben, but you are one crazy motherfucker. He would take mushrooms all the time, and he would not know if he was sleeping and dreaming or awake and in the mushroom trip. So once he was standing on the end of this building, this tall fucking 20-story building out on the top, looking down at the road on the very edge of the building saying he was saying if i fall i'm just gonna wake up and everyone's like no bro if you fucking fall you're gonna die get your ass off that ledge right now and it's just fucking bizarre so anything that kind of makes you feel out of reality for me anyway because i was a fucking degenerate drug addict alcoholic for years but so any any anything that takes me away from clear head now i hate Uh, weed is the only thing i do now well i mean it just soothes you Puts me in a better mood. Yeah. Mm. Puts me in a better mood. Like even before bed. Just calms you down. Even. Always. No, okay. <laughs> always. Yeah. No. Always. I'm trying to reach out to the demographic of people that don't necessarily understand it. Yeah. Yet. Well, they should try it and then they would like it and then it would change their eating habits, mm-hmm. their sleeping habits. Um, yeah. I think it's a definitely I, I find it hard to like I've <laughs> I've said to her I'm going to give up so many times and she's just like it's day two and I'm fucking the angriest cunt on earth yeah. and she'd be like what are you doing what are you doing I'm fucking detoxing but why why are you putting yourself through it just mm-hmm. go pick up some weed mm-hmm. oh alright <laughs> <laughs> hey babe <laughs>